isn't just made up of mountains and hills and valleys, any more than a tree stands tall because of its outstretched branches and colorful leaves. It's what's at the root of it that matters. And so it is with this land we call ours. Like a giant tree, it sprung out of the wilderness. And the way west was cleared by men who, by guts and by God, mastered it all. But no man who ever entered the west was the same again. And neither was the land. And neither are we. It's our heritage. It's your land and it's mine. It's the only land we'll ever have, and it's good enough for me. John Wayne made many of his finest movies right here in Monument Valley, from Stagecoach to The Searchers. He played so many of our legendary heroes that he became kind of a legend himself. He and his movies, like this place, have become part of our national heritage. I think it's because John Wayne, the man, stood up for what he believed in. And John Wayne, the actor, played those roles that showed a man struggling to do what he thought was right. That was Duke, all right. Up front with everybody, and no apologies for anything. And I remember once he said to me, Hank, you old son of a bitch, always tell it like it is, because then tomorrow you won't be wondering what you were lying about yesterday. One night I, I was in the, the coast of Bravo with him, and uh, he decided we ought to go slumming. So we got us a taxi, and we went all up and down that coastline, just walking into saloons and things. Of course, people recognize him right away. But I think it was one of the most fun nights he ever had. <laughs> He was a very dedicated, loyal American, and as, as to his political philosophy, I would say he was quite conservative, probably as much conservative as I am. Now, I grew up on John Wayne movies, and to be honest with you, that's the epitome of America. He is Mr. America to me. Uh, well, of course, uh, <clears throat> Humphrey Bogart was uh, super cool, and James Cagney, mm, tough, a tough little monkey. And then you had Alan Ladd. He was a tough guy, too. He could punch you in the ankle. Uh, you had you had Clark Gable, of course, who had a very strong personality. And then you had John Wayne, who was, I guess, everybody combined. John Wayne could beat the hell out of a lot of them. He rode in saddles where no one rode. He fought in battles from shore to shore And like a man answering destiny He stands a hero above them all Charted oceans, defended his beliefs with strong emotions, with tender love, and like a man answering destiny, he stands a hero above them all. I met Duke in 1952 when we made a movie together, and it was he who suggested me for Matt Dillon on the television series Gunsmoke. A real friend. He was honest, strong, independent, and proud. Exactly the kind of man he portrayed in his final film, The Shootist, where he plays a dying gunfighter. It has become both the end of an era in movie making, and in a way, the story of his life. Like the character, Duke faced many a showdown, more with raw courage than with foresight, in the true spirit of the American hero. We didn't know it then, but John Wayne was telling us the rules he had lived by, on screen and off, for the last time. I won't be wronged, I won't be insulted, I won't be laid a hand on. I don't do these things to other people, and 
I require the same from them. But how could you get into so many fights and then always come out on top? I nearly tied you shooting. Friend, there's nobody up there shooting back at you. It isn't always being fast or even accurate that counts. It's being willing. I found out early that most men, regardless of cause or need, aren't willing. They blink an eye or draw a breath before they pull a trigger. I won't. While he was making The Shootist, he talked to Dick Cavett about his love of the movie business. Well, you know, you get toward the end of a picture and you say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a year off. Yeah. And then there's two weeks go by and uh, you're starting to look around and say, I wonder if there's a good script around any place. So you do get a little antsy. Oh, and see it's like I want to work all the time. Yeah. I enjoy it. It's my life. John Wayne had a long and enormously successful career. He made over 200 movies in 50 years and produced and directed some of them. His films are still making money, and they've grossed over $700 million. Duke always worked hard to support his large family, and he wanted them beside him. He demanded loyalty and respect from his friends and from strangers, too. He would stand up and fight for his country, right or wrong. And he reserved the right to tell whoever would listen if he didn't like the way the country was being run. It was the good old Midwestern code of behavior his father had taught him. Mary and Michael Morrison, a strapping 13-pound baby, was born in Winterset, Iowa in 1907, the son of a pharmacist and his strong-willed wife. The family moved from Iowa and homesteaded on a small ranch near the Mojave Desert. But the hard life drew them back to civilization, Glendale, California. The good-looking new boy in town was nicknamed Duke by the local firemen and became one of the stars of the high school football team. He won a scholarship to the University of Southern California and began working summers at the Fox Movie Studios, doing everything from sweeping up to moving props for the directors. One of them was the great John Ford. Well, Mr. Ford says, so you're a football player, and I said, well, playing at USC. He said, uh, see how you get down. So I got down, braced on my uh, forearms and my uh, feet, and he just kicked my arms out from under me and stuck my nose in that mud that they'd made for Mother McCree, and I'll tell you, it wasn't the sod of old Ireland, and it really hurt. So not being interested in a motion picture career at that time, I said, let's try it again. Well, it's hard for one fellow on the line to take out anybody when they can move wide on you. So as I thought he would, he started to go around this side, and I just whirled and kicked him and hit him in the chest, and he sat him down on the part that goes over the fence last. And uh, he looked up with a little surprise, and there was a deadly silence, and right then was a deciding point in my career in motion pictures. It was the right kind of start for their friendship. Ford was a bully on the set and a buddy in the bar. He gave Duke a bit part in the silent film Hangman's House. Duke left USC in 1929 and chose a career in the movies. He played a midshipman in Salute and a college student in Words and Music. In 1930, director Raoul Walsh was considering him for the lead in The Big Trail, an epic western. He gave Marion Morrison a new name, John Wayne, and thought he was helping the young man by sending him to an acting coach. There was a, one of these uh, dialogue directors that had been sent out. And he said, and you go to him uh, twice a week. There's a line in the picture where this fella can't go on with the, with the train, and he's been with it for six months going across the desert. And in the distance is the great white mountain. And he's supposed to, with sentiment, say, uh, well, Zach, when you get there, tell the great white mountain hello for me. But this guy was using the cape in every line, and he had me out saying, Tell the great white mountain hello for me. And uh, <laughs> so after uh, Walsh found that out, he gave me the test and finally the part. Tell that great white mountain hello for me. Goodbye, Zeke. <laughs> the big trail was a box office flop. All thoughts of stardom vanished, and Duke began a simple struggle to stay in the movie business. He played more college boys and more cowboys, saving girls from runaway horses. And because he could do his own stunts, he was perfect for adventure serials, like the 12-part Hurricane Express. 
He took whatever parts he could get, waiting, hoping for his big break. Sometimes sharing the screen with starlets on the way up, like Barbara Stanwyck. But it was the Western, often produced one a week, that paid his bills. Wayne tried everything, including singing. Drop your guns out low and cinch them on tight. There'll be blood a-running in town before night. There'll be guns a-blazing singing with love. Why, that's singing Sandy. Tonight you'll be drinking... Hmm? Most notorious gunman since Billy the Kid. But even an aspiring actor knows when to say cut. Make it fast, Slippery. This is your last draw. For nearly ten years, John Wayne made at least six pictures a year, most of them B-Westerns, learning his craft the hard way. By 1937, he was 30 years old, his hopes for stardom were fading, and he was sick of cheap cowboy movies and fast buck producers. One weekend, his hard-drinking, card-playing buddy, John Ford, took Duke out on his yacht and let him read a screenplay. It would turn out to be a winning hand for both of them. Played out right here in Monument Valley. They were staying at a trading post that I visited very often. I ran a trading post myself uh, farther to the west than that place, and... Oh, steady. Ho, ho. You know, Ford would probably have picked on Wayne all the time. I'm sure that he did on Stagecoach because Wayne told me that, uh, that he kind of picked on him. Um, and that Wayne thought it was his way of getting the rest of the cast to be uh, on Wayne's side and kind of help him because this was the first time he'd done such an important role. Well, a big scene came up and he just bawled me out to where... Finally, all the crew, all the crew, all the, all the uh, actors, uh, the cast was completely on my side. And uh, from then on, I had the cast helping me, you know, as my first time in the, really in the big time working with so many. Toughness and innocence. Stagecoach became a classic, restoring the Western to Hollywood's A-list. And John Wayne, at last, had become a star. But all was not well at home. His relationship with his wife was in serious trouble. He had married Josephine Sienz in 1933, after a long courtship and against her family's wishes. They had four children during those early tough years, but her need for a quiet home life and his work-hard, play-hard lifestyle wouldn't mix. Duke and Josie separated, but he kept in close touch with his children, a loyal father. Meanwhile, beautiful women came into his life. All was one at a time. There were really very few, considering he was one of the most attractive new stars in Hollywood. Marlena Dietrich was one of them. They made three films together. For you. In the next few years, he tried to expand his range of roles, playing in everything from a Eugene O'Neill drama to swashbuckling adventures. He kept on making westerns, of course, and wasn't too happy about it. Even when he worked with his screen idol, Harry Carey. When they were making Shepherd of the Hills, they were sitting on the set, and my dad was sitting off by himself. And Duke came over to my mom, and uh, they started talking, and he started grousing about uh, the fact that uh, he wanted to play more variety on the screen, that... that uh, that he felt that he was falling into a niche that was just, he was the same in every picture and uh, that was bothering him. Uh, my mom said, now wait a minute. She said, you're a big, good looking outdoor guy. You're more or less in the mold of Harry. And she pointed over to my father who was sitting quite a little ways away. And she said, would you want to see him change on the screen? And Duke went, well, hell no, you know, no, you know, not, not, in any way and he said she said well that's the way you are, are you ever gonna it was important advice and he knew it he approached the western with new enthusiasm and for the first time produced his own film it was angel and the bad man and he romanced gail russell on set and off if i go away you go with me if i go away they go with me the movie wasn't a great success but it didn't discourage duke he would produce again someday he returned to Monument Valley with John Ford to make Fort Apache, 
fighting it out with the Indians and Henry Fonda. I don't see them, not a one. Well, they're down there, sir, among the rocks. Have you seen them, Captain? I don't have to, I know. How? If I were coaches, that's where I'd take up position. And that dust cloud beyond? It's an Apache trick. Probably squaws and children dragging mesquite. Very ingenious, Captain. You make me suspect your coaches have studied under Alexander the Great, or Bonaparte at the least. Gentlemen, mount your troops. We're charging the column of fours. Mounted in fours? That's suicide, Colonel. I tell you, they're sure. down there. Captain York, you're relieved of command of your troop. There's no room in this regiment for a coward. At your service, sir. Duke plays a cavalry officer nearing retirement in She Wore a Yellow Ribbon. We filmed Yellow Ribbon in Monument Valley. And I'll never forget it because John Ford made us drive from Albuquerque. He wanted us to get sort of the, the atmosphere and so forth. And it was a terrible trip. We stayed at Goulding's trading post, and uh, it was it was a very comfortable location, except when Ford got us out in the elements and you know on horseback and waited for the rain, waited for the storm. He has a great keen sense of when a thing is sentimental and when it is maudlin, and uh, he's not afraid of those kind of scenes. As a matter of fact, one of the things that he told me early in my career was Duke, uh, you're going to get a lot of scenes during your life that are going to seem corny to you. And he said, play them, play them to the hill. If it's East Lynn, play it. And he says, you'll get by with it. But if you start trying to play it with your tongue and your cheek and getting cute, you'll lose size yourself and you'll, the scene will be lost. A small token from the troop. They all put in the hat for it, sir. Even Sergeant Hockbauer. It's solid silver, sir. Brought on from Kansas City. There's a sentiment on the back of it. To Captain Brittles from C Troop. <laughs> Lest we forget. <clears throat> Thank you, Corporal. Thank you. Thank all of you. Captain Brittles was one of Duke's best roles, and one of his favorites. But the role that changed John Wayne's screen presence forever is Tom Dunson in Red River, directed by Howard Hawks. Duke's performance is now recognized as one of the greatest in any Western film. Cherry was right. You're soft. You should have let him kill me, because I'm going to kill you. I'll catch up with you. I don't know when, but I'll catch up. Every time you turn around, expect to see me. There's one time you'll turn around and I'll be there. I'll kill you, Matt. I was impressed by Red River when it came out. It's, it's, it's quintessential American, and it foreshadows the whole 60s. The conflict between John Wayne and Montgomery Clift is the two Americas right there encapsulated. Cliff, the anarchic, uh, modern, uh, individualistic, slightly depraved, uh, self-absorbed narcissist, and the and Wayne, the the uh, obsessed, old order, reacting against this person. And that tension between those two actors is one of the most brilliant things. Go on, draw. I said, draw. And I'll make you. You're soft. All right, before.
14 years I've been scared, but it's going to be all right. Get up. Come on, get up. I changed my mind. Go ahead, beat each other crazy. Maybe it'll put some sense in both of you. Go ahead, go on, do it. Use this so you can't it's his. You better marry that girl, Matt. Yeah, I think I do. When are you going to stop telling people what to do? Right now. At least as soon as... When? As soon as I tell you one thing more. What? When we get back to the ranch, I want you to change the brand. We'll be like this. Red River D. We'll add an end to it. You don't mind that, do you? No. You've earned it. John Wayne fought many battles out here in the West, but they were just minor skirmishes compared to the World War II battles he would recreate on the screen in the 40s and early 50s. If ever a man was born to be a real-life soldier, it was Duke. Gutsy, strong, a natural leader. He tried to enlist, but he was 34 years old, had four children, and an old injury. He was politely turned down, no matter how many strings he tried to pull. But he had an assignment in Hollywood, to keep morale up and patriotism high. John Wayne was the right man for the job. Even though only 10% of his movies have war themes, he became our symbol of combat, bravery, and heroism. His first war movie, Flying Tigers, was the story of American volunteers fighting the Japanese for China before Pearl Harbor. It introduces John Wayne as a strict disciplinarian, teaching survival in wartime. Jim. There's an army truck out of here day after tomorrow for Lyceo. Be on it. Don't say that, Jim. Jill, then you're confined to your quarters. But I'm still a good flyer, Jim. I'll knock down ten of those rats for the one of our boys. It's out of my hands now. None of these men will ever fly with you again. And they have to fly. even tougher in the Philippines with Anthony Quinn in Back to Batan. Stop acting like a schoolboy. What do you mean, schoolboy? Only a schoolboy would expose himself and his men like you did this morning. I know it's tough when the woman you love goes over to the enemy, but you can't let her tear Look, you Joe, that's none of your business. That's right. But risking the lives of these men is my business. Keep it up and you'll have the whole company wiped out. This is a dirty war we're fighting, Andres. And we got to fight it the right way. What do you want me to do? I want you to act like a soldier. Remember, you're in command of a company of men. You've got the responsibility of their lives in your hands. In The Fighting Seabees, he is killed in action. Hold your fire till you get them under your gun. Then let them have it. This is one of only eight times John Wayne dies on screen. John Ford was given leave from the Navy to make They Were Expendable in 1944.
before it was released, and it was more successful with the critics than at the box office. Four years later, Wayne starred in the finest of all World War II movies, Sands of Iwo Jima. He was the original hard-nosed bullying sergeant, assigned to whip his young recruits into Marines. I'm gonna tell you something, Conway. I'm gonna tell all of you. I'm gonna make it nice and simple so you'll all understand it. They handed me you guys as a present, a regular Easter basket. They told me to get you into some kind of shape so you could handle a little piece of this war. And that's what I'm gonna do. And that means I'm gonna tell you what to do every day and every minute of every day. I'm gonna tell you how to button your buttons. I'll even tell you when to blow your noses. And if you do something I don't like, I'm gonna jump. And when I land, it'll hurt. I'm gonna ride you till you can't stand up. But when you do stand up, you're gonna be Marines. After making over 100 movies, John Wayne as Sergeant Stryker was nominated for an Oscar but didn't win. He did win something much more important. He was named number one in all the Hollywood polls in 1950, and for the next 25 years he stayed right up there in that top handful of superstars. I've been in more uniforms than George Jessel. I've been in more battles than Napoleon, more wars than Germany. And I've captured Batan, Corregidor, Fort Apache, and Marina Hara. <laughs> Let me tell you that your favorite motion picture actors for 1976 are Jack Nicholson, Robert Redford, and John Wayne. And the winner is Mr. John Wayne. They were America's favorite couple. Her fiery personality and his quiet, strong presence made the sparks fly. In Rio Grande, their first movie together, he's a cavalry officer and she's a southern aristocrat. And he has left her and their son to pursue his career. First of all, there's respect, which is something that is maybe in short supply. and You don't feel that much from people like Redford and Newman. You do not feel any kind of deep respect for women in them. And you really do with Wayne. Um, he listens to women. He's not so self-obsessed. Again, it's this whole thing of submitting to something else. He's not the be-all and the end-all in the modern way. He's not the individualist who is completely self-contained. There are other people in his world. In The Quiet Man, directed by John Ford, he plays an American boxer who has killed a man in the ring. He retreats to Ireland and vows never to fight again. His wedding night with Mary Kate is ruined by her brother's refusal to pay the dowry. They tussle all the way through. It's this struggle for dominance. She wants to keep this dowry and he wants to get rid of it because his, his view is that a woman should submit, a wife should submit and, and give up her dowry. And he finally comes to understand that this is not just money. It is a sign of her independence, a sign of her self-respect. And he understands that. So I think... Under the surface, you always feel this tremendous respect for women. Danaher, you owe me 350 pounds. Let's have it. I'll pay you. Never. That breaks all bargains. <laughs> you can take your sister back. It's your custom, not mine. No fortune, no marriage. We call it quits. You do this to me, your own wife, after, after it's what done. I... <laughs> There's your dirty money. Take it. Count it, you spawn. And look, if ever I see that face of yours again, I'll push that through it. I'll be going on home now. 
I'll have the supper ready for you. All four of Duke's children were on the set of The Quiet Man, and so was Chata, his second wife, since 1946. It had been as volatile a relationship as any of his on the screen. Chata, she's the original Mexican spitfire. But Duke, uh, you know, I remember once he described how he, uh, she'd locked herself in her room and she was drunk, and Duke went over and kicked the door down to get in the room. And he was worried about that. He said, what will the public think? I said, Duke, the public expects Duke Wayne to kick the door down. I said, as long as you don't go against your image, you're fine. And the public loved him even more after that. Yeah. While his marriage was falling apart, he and Maureen starred in The Wings of Eagles, the true story of a military man and the wife he has sacrificed to his career. It's one of Duke's least known but finest performances. I've got somewhere. Sure, sure. You're somewhere. The kids are somewhere, and I'm somewhere. But we're really nowhere, unless we're together. If it isn't a family, it's... it's nothing. By the time Chata and Duke were divorced, he had already met the Peruvian-born actress Pilar Pellette. We had a, a phone call from um, Duke's attorney, and the attorney told Duke, uh, well, Duke, I have your divorce papers in my hand. So Duke hung up the phone, came into my room. I was, I was there with uh, Duke's dear secretary of many, many years, Mary St. John. So he came up to me and kissed me, and he said, how would you like to get married today? And I said, today? He says, yes. He says, I'm a divorced man. So I said, well, I don't have a, a dress or anything. She says, don't worry about a thing. Just go with Mary, get yourself a dress, and come back, and we'll be married by sunset. The years that followed World War II were the beginning of John Wayne's political life. In Washington, the House Committee on Un-American Activities began hearings on alleged Communist Party infiltration of the movies. And Hollywood was divided into two camps. There was mudslinging on both sides and blacklisting by the Hollywood studios. Duke was in the thick of it. He succeeded Clark Gable and Robert Taylor as president of the Motion Picture Alliance and served for three terms. A few years later, he and I made a picture together about the Cold War in America. Political police are sacred, he says. They delivered 1,600 microfilms from the laboratory to a common turned courier. Is that political belief? I just work here. That's wishful thinking. We can't give this fellow a subpoena. He left the country yesterday on a Polish freighter. I shouldn't have handed him that subpoena. I should have stuffed it down his throat with my hand still around it. It's just me and him on a subpoena on his dark porch. Who would know the difference about I throwing him one left hook? Young, ain't he? Well, I think some of the movies he made, you know, on his own, like Big Jim McLean or the Green Berets, uh, those are films that I think he... You know, he believed what those movies were uh, saying politically. I think, um, I don't know if he believed it so much or whether he believed in the government that believed it. Because basically he was very simplistic. You know, America, right or wrong, it was a little bit like that. Ever since I met, met Duke, that was his one thing in life, is to make the Alamo. He wanted to... Um, make all of the heroes, I guess, that, serve, that uh, were um, succumbed in the Alamo, heroes. So, as a consequence, he had a lot of um, negative reaction about it. But he was the kind of a guy that when he believed in something, nobody was going to stop him. For over 10 years, Duke had been obsessed with the idea of filming the story of the Alamo. Against all advice, he decided to be the producer, director, and star, and invested every cent he had in it. John Wayne's version of the Alamo was shot down in Brackettville, Texas, which is about 125 miles west and a little bit south of San Antonio, Texas. And 
the Alamo building that they had in the picture of the Alamo was copied after the real Alamo up in San Antonio, but they couldn't shoot it up there because there was so many high buildings around it. Uh, Duke got in an awful lot of people. He went down ahead of the cast and uh, through his men gathered in all the loose people around for 50 miles, I guess, and, and shot a great deal of the background before we got down there. Well, he remained very stable. I don't know how he did it with all the pressure on him to get scenes that he approved of, that he liked, and he thought that people would enjoy doing. But uh, he was very stable, and I don't know how he held up under everything because there was a lot of things going on that over which he had no control. But uh, he kept the company working and everybody doing their job that they had come down to do. Duke directed the spectacular battle scenes of the Alamo using everything he had learned from his stuntman friends. He was chain smoking, sleeping four hours a night, and he lost 30 pounds during the filming, but still gave a stirring performance as Davy Crockett. The Alamo was released as a three-hour, 19-minute historical epic, more spectacle than story. It was one of the five nominees for Best Picture of the Year, a tribute to a man who had obviously been paying close attention to all the aspects of the movie business. In a three-page fold-out ad in Life magazine, Duke couldn't resist mixing his politics and his movie making. He suggested that people compare the 1960 presidential candidates to the real heroes of the Alamo. Four years later, he was right up front in the campaign of an old friend. Fellow Republicans, hello. I'm real glad to be able to talk to you folks today about the coming election. I'm sure we all agree on our candidate. We would talk with each other about what he thought I could do better and what I was doing wrong. He was a great follower of the actions of people in politics to, that were elected to positions. He'd be critical of them. He would be a, in an approval of the things they did that were right according to his way of thinking. But he lived for his profession. And that was about it. After Goldwater was defeated, uh, a group of Republicans came up to uh, Duke and... Um, they asked him, uh, Mr. Wayne, I think that you would be a wonderful um, candidate for the Republican Party. And Duke looked at them and smiled, and he said, first, I uh, cannot afford the cutting salary, and second, who would vote for an actor anyway? Thank you very much. Andy and Duke. Andy, if you can get him to run, I'll vote for him, too. I think that what Duke felt was what I felt at the time, and that is the great immorality of the Vietnam War was for our government to be asking young men to give up their lives in that war when the government had no intention of winning it because they were afraid of what might follow that might be worse if uh, we tried to win that particular war. And uh, as I say, I think that was the great immorality. I think Duke felt the same. Duke was against the war in Vietnam, but once America was in it, he wanted to win it. He made the first major film about the war in 1968. And it was just like all the other John Wayne war movies. Our boys were the heroes, the enemy was evil, and war was hell. I never got any, any uh, flack from doing John Wayne, even during the Vietnam period. Um, he was still popular. I mean, there were a lot of... Uh, a lot of young people, a lot of students uh, who didn't agree with him, perhaps didn't like him. But on the whole, uh, I think John Wayne was always popular. And if you liked him on the screen, uh, you accepted him. The anti-war people didn't like it, but the rest of the country loved it. The Green Berets was one of his highest grossing films ever.
Ham chunk. You always knew it could happen, didn't you? But I didn't want it to. None of us did. Was, was my Peter Sod brave? He was very brave. Are you going to be? I'll try. I know you will. And I'm sure that your Peter's son would want you to have that. What will what, what will happen to me now? You let me worry about that green beret. Duke hated war but loved the American GI. He entertained them, inspired them, and they touched his life. Captain Steve Hansen, a 25-year-old Marine, had sent his wife and little boy a picture the day before he was shot down in Laos. He was bare-chested, wearing his helmet, and on the back he had written, Me as John Wayne. Duke wore Hansen's POW bracelet and kept in touch with Carol and Todd, sending the boy presents and letters such as this one. Dear Todd, I wish you a wonderful life. Just don't expect too much out of it, and you'll have some wonderful years. <laughs> That's my sermon from the mount this year, Todd. Give him hell. The Green Berets was John Wayne's tribute to the fighting men who would come back, and the men like Steve Hansen who didn't. <laughs> Part three, John Wayne wins an Oscar and battles cancer with true grit and real courage. In the West, riding alone, standing tall. That's how we remember Duke best. He always seemed larger than life, the ultimate hero. But if you look at his films, he's usually the underdog or a loner trying to resolve something in his past. Yes, he wins, but almost always at a high cost to himself. That's the kind of character he played when he worked with director John Ford here in Monument Valley in 1955. He plays Ethan Edwards in The Searchers. It's one of John Wayne's most haunting and memorable films. <laughs> I think it was the strongest performance that he gave in his whole life. Uh, he stayed into that character even when he was off the screen. Uh, he didn't kid around as much on that picture as, uh, as he did on other shows. He didn't laugh as much. He was really into that, into that character of uh, Ethan Edwards. And, uh, uh, you know, he was this hard-bitten, bitter man, uh, really a racist you know, terrible racist about, uh, uh, towards the Indians. I found Lucy back in the canyon. Wrapped her in my coat. Buried her with my own hands. Thought it best to keep it from you. Oh. Did they... What was she... What do you want me to do, draw you a picture? Spell it out? Don't ever ask me. The Searchers is the one film where he is, he goes too far in, his, in, in the rage and the violence within him. His brother has been killed. His brother's wife, who was, he was secretly in love with, has been killed. His brother's whole family has been wiped out, except the girl who we soon find out has grown up among the Indians. These are my people. Once mayor, go. Go, Martin, please. Stand aside, Martin. No, you don't, Ethan. Ethan, no, you don't! Stand aside. He 
he's about to throttle her because she's turned into an Indian. She's been assimilated by the Indians, by the Comanches. And then he can't, and he embraces her, and it's this wonderful scene of redemption. Let's go home, Debbie. And one of Harry Carey's uh, stances was grabbing his elbow and just looking off, and he always seemed like such a lonely character to me. made a movie about a character like Ethan in The Searchers doesn't mean that Ford agreed with the character. Uh, in order to make a film, he had to show a certain kind of person. Uh, Wayne, on the other hand, uh, you, his politics were quite a, a, out front, and he continued to be out front about it. Ford, at one point, was quoted as saying, you know, I love that damn Republican. Duke never dodged the tough questions, even though he knew his answers would be unpopular and probably misinterpreted. The subject of Indian rights was always a reporter's favorite. I know the terrible thing that we did was to put them on reservations. That uh, takes a man's human dignity away from him, takes his desire to better himself away from him. That's what they want to do with that cradle to grave socialism. They'll have our whole country like that if we keep paying all our taxes for these minorities that you're provoking. He repeated those views in a famous Playboy interview. So when Duke appeared on a Bob Hope show, they worked it into a skit. Come in, baby. Engines! It's a raid! Five women and children! The wagons! Form a circle! Now hold it right there or I'll tickle your teepee with buckshot. Oh, hush up. Now, give me that gun. <laughs> it's my fault I should never have taken her to see the Battle of the Alamo. <laughs> Losing one picture and that's all they remember. Western movies began to change in the late 50s. They became town westerns instead of stories about long cattle drives and Indian fights. Directors like Howard Hawks knew that the audience would relate best to stories in a setting they recognized. And for most people, that was a town, no matter how small. There were new kinds of women for Duke to deal with, too. Here's a handbill. About a gambler they're interested in catching up with. You know him? Says he had a girl with him. Says the girl's about 22, five foot five inches tall. Good figure. Brown hair and wears feathers. Now, the man isn't our friend in the checkered vest, but you could be the girl. Yes, I could be. As a matter of fact, I am. Howard Hawks liked picking a new woman and uh, he told me that the reason he liked it was because the other ones were too difficult and uh, and I can see what he would mean because now if I were to get that same job I would be more difficult because I'd have more bad habits that he couldn't get rid of yep. Howard wanted a certain rhythm or non-rhythm I was so new and green and uh, unskilled, so between the two of us, Hawks had quite a hard time getting our scenes. I'm glad we tried it a second time. It's better when two people do it. Well, I've kept you long enough. You better run along now and do your job. The new breed of Western woman was more aggressive and often left him speechless. After Rio Bravo, Duke made eight major movies and did cameo appearances in The Longest Day and How the West Was Won. He was exhausted and working hard to pay his Alamo debts. He had a terrible cough and couldn't shake it. 
but he and Pilar headed for Spain to make Circus World. That part gone, it's out of control. We gotta make a fire break if we're gonna save any of this tent. There was quite an accident when he was making Circus World. Apparently, one of the tents caught, caught on fire. Nobody told him, come on, you know, it's time to get get out of here and he just kind of stuck around until the smoke got really bad and at the last minute he escaped but by that time it had caused serious damage to his lungs and he really literally could not could not get his air I was not at the set at the time but when he came home I could see that this guy was a sick man the medical exam he had after the fire may have saved his life he was diagnosed as having lung cancer and was operated on immediately. Studio publicists lied about his condition. Duke being a friend, I went over to see him. And uh, I met the door by a nurse, and she says, well, Mr. Wayne is not receiving any visitors. Well, Duke heard my voice. And as only Duke could say, he says, let the SOB in. So I go in there, and I'm no sooner in, and Duke says, well, Jim, I licked the big C. And I said, the big C? I, Jesus, first I'd heard about it. I, I'd fallen for the leg injury story. And he says, yeah, he said, they took a tumor off my lung as uh, big as a baseball. He says, but I've licked it. He says, I said, I said, Duke, we should have a story on that because it's a great thing for cancer sufferers to know that John Wayne has licked cancer. He says, well, he says, uh, Hal Wallace, the producer, has got a picture coming out, and they want me to not say anything about it because uh, it might hurt business. He says, just sit on the story, and I'll, I'll let you know when you can use it. Well, it's an amazing thing. When I broke my story, Duke, within one week, got 50,000 letters from people suffering from cancer. And saying how inspired they were. Did you do a lot of praying at that point in your life? or Are you a Listen, prayer? I've prayed more than once in my life, but I, I felt a little closer to that man upstairs at that time and sure wished he'd give me a hand. And if it worked out in his, his uh, plan for things, and luckily it did. But and you went back. You went back great. to smoking. I know a lot of your friends. They said you went back. Well, to I went back to. I don't cigars. know that smoking, smoking gave me uh, cancer. Well, you don't know that it didn't either. No. Well, I mean the same thing. I mean, you, lots of people have been killed stepping off a curb. I didn't stop stepping off a curb. <laughs> Twenty years after that operation, the findings of attorneys filing lawsuits for Utah residents hinted at what might have caused Duke's cancer. John Wayne had shot a film, The Conqueror, in St. George, Utah, in 1954. Less than a year before, the area had been exposed to radioactive fallout from a bomb they nicknamed Dirty Harry, along with 10 other atomic shots. The government had assured director Dick Powell that it was safe. So day after day, the 220 actors and extras battled in the sand. They were in Utah, about 100 miles from the Nevada Proving Ground. And first, I think it was uh, Dick Powell died of cancer. And then Pedro Armendariz got cancer. Agnes Moorhead. Uh, Duke. And then all of a sudden, it, Jesus, it all came together, you know. I thought, gee, you know, here's this uh, radiation and all these people dying. And I checked into it and found out Seventy people on that movie died of cancer, and God knows how many extras, because they hired uh, thousands of Indians to play uh, Mongols, and uh, there's never been any record kept of them, but there have been 70 people, the cast and crew of that picture died from cancer. Duke went back to work just three months after losing a lung. He made six movies in four years, and then, at age 61, got the role he was born to play, Rooster Cogburn in the film True Grit, with a screenplay by Marguerite Roberts. My politics and John Wayne's politics couldn't be more different. He was a very conservative man, a terrific patriot, and I was a blacklisted writer. I was blacklisted for 10 years, and uh, I was back in pictures and working, and uh, 
But when he heard that I was on the script of True Grit and his friends heard, they uh, uh, tried to talk him into going to Wallace and getting me off the script. But he waited till he read the script and he liked the script and he said to hell with you to his friends and he uh, refused to uh, uh, say anything at all about me working on it. He was really remarkable. Rusha Cogburn was a drunk and Wayne played him as a drunk and a dirty old guy, fat guy. I mean to kill you in one minute, Ned, or see you hanged in Fort Smith at Judge Parker's convenience. Which will it be? I call that bull talk for a one-eyed fat man. Fill your hand, you son of a bitch! The book sort of just ended, it sort of drifted off, and Matty and uh, Matty Ross and Rooster Cogburn were so important that they, they should have been the absolute focus for the ending, and they weren't in the book. Yeah. So I made that ending, where Rooster comes to visit her, and she invites him to be buried in their family plot. You have no kin. I do not count Chen Li and the cat. Now where else would you end up in some neglected patch of weeds? Well, now I might just take you up on that offer, sis. If you'll excuse me if I don't try to move in too soon. Trust you to buy another tall horse. Yeah. He's not as game as Bo, but Stonehill says he can jump a four rail fence. He's too old too fat to be jumping horses. Well, come to see a fat old man sometime. Yeah! Yeah! The winner is John Wayne in two Grits. I'd have known that, I'd have put that patch on 35 years earlier. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm no stranger to this podium. I've come up here and picked up these beautiful golden men before, but always for friends. One night I picked up two, one for Admiral John Ford, one for our beloved Gary Cooper. I was very clever and witty that night, the envy of even Bob Hope. <laughs> but tonight I don't feel very clever or very witty. I feel very grateful, very humble, and all thanks to many, many people. After True Grit, he went relentlessly on to make a dozen more films, working with some of the great ladies of Hollywood and Broadway. There are some of us who, you know, were raised in the method and so on. And there's been a lot of discussion by great teachers saying that the Duke was a method actor, taking purely from himself and always playing the same thing. I, I think Duke is an American phenomenon. Uh, we do have some that are. He is a really American phenomena. This is the way the American man uh, feels he should be. 
to the movie going public john wayne is the symbol of masculinity miss hepburn you are the symbol of the independent liberated why woman. didn't you just say femininity yeah why didn't you because that's, <laughs> that's what she right, is well, that, that is true that is true but it's kind of a it's she kind is of the a... most feminine thing that i've worked with in about 45 years i'm feminine enough to make him sweet you see <laughs> <laughs> that's because i'm cagey <laughs> yeah she's pretty cute i'll tell you that <laughs> she makes you feel good all day it, it does a lot, then I take it, for, for both of you. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. It's nice to have a man who's a man. Duke and Pilar separated in 1973. Their three children had held them together, but the demands of his career and location shooting away from home finally ended it. They were never divorced, but Duke was not a man to live out his life alone. Well, he did care about public opinion, some of the things that were said. He, he didn't care that the world knew about our relationship. Uh, but the things that, pardon me, the National Enquirer or the Star, some of those things that they printed uh, that we said, we had never even spoken to them. And then on one occasion, uh, I think it was the, the, I won't, I don't know, one of the papers, I won't mention the name, uh, had written something. And Duke asked me, he said, you write him and tell him I want a retraction or I'm going to sue the... And I called the guy, and he said, fine, we'll retract it if you'll get us an interview with John Wayne. And you're probably not going to put this in, but Duke said, you tell him I said go to hell, and they'll never get an interview with me. Of course, it was very exciting to be around Duke, not just for his personality and the type of person he was, but it was also very exciting to go places with him. He used to tell me that he loved taking me places he said, Pat, I've already seen this time and time again. He said, but I love seeing it through your eyes. He said, it makes me feel young again. When he got the script for the shootist, he was, he was excited about it, and it never crossed his mind at the time that this was going to be his last picture and that uh, he would later be dying of cancer, which was what happened with um, the person in the shootist. Why don't you just say it? Flat out. All right. You have a cancer. Advanced. Damn. I'm sorry, folks. You told me I was strong as an ox. Or well, even an ox died. I remember the things that he didn't like about the script, and they did a lot of rewrites on it. Look out! Ron Howard, who played the young boy, at the end of the picture was still supposed to end up being a bad boy. That was rewritten so that uh, the influence that he had on this kid turned his life around to make him you know, come out to be one of the good guys. Uh, we'd gone on his boat out to Catalina. He told me he'd sold the boat and this is our last trip. So we went out there, I think there was just he and the, his secretary and my wife and the regular crew. So we stayed four days, but he wasn't feeling good at all. And uh, of course he went out on his uh, whaler, that was those little boats he had, and we were out on one of them and he's trying to tell me how they'd gotten all the cancer and he was so happy about it, which of course was bravo. But then we went back to his home and we stayed with him a night or two, playing cards and visiting, just sitting out and visiting. And, on that morning, we got ready to go home. He, has, he had he, Pontiac people always gave him a car every year. So he pulled around to the front door, and, and I had a feeling this might be our last visit. So we gave him another, that big Mexican embrasio. And he said, wait a minute. And then he went back and came out with this big Panama, and I still have it. Put it on my head, like a cowboy's farewell. <laughs> Duke died on June 11, 1979. 
mourned around the world by three generations of movie fans and friends. You know, Duke knew everything about making movies, and he'd be as excited about a new project as a kid. And if you were working with him, you better be as bright-eyed and bushy-tailed as he was. Duke was generous and genuinely kind to everyone, family, friends, co-workers, even the fans who wrote to him for money with the darndest stories you ever heard. He was that kind of a guy. Duke was the most patriotic man I ever knew. He could tear into the government like a Bengal tiger. But you didn't badmouth America while he was around. Shortly before his death, Congress voted to award him a special medal. And the inscription read simply, John Wayne, American. Duke never expected or wanted to be a legend. But when it happened, he lived up to it. You can bet there'll never be another one like him. The Old West, the Wild West, is long gone. But that doesn't matter. What does matter is that nothing ever dies if folks don't want it to. If I'm going to send some neighbor's kid out to be killed, I'll be willing at least to risk uh, my life to save a few of those boys. So uh, I think we should have won it about four years ago at about a quarter of the loss of men and had the respect of the world. Instead of that, we uh, pussyfoot around and now we're trying to get out of it without uh, being a disgrace. I shoot off my mouth once in a while more than I should probably, as I've done here a couple of times. But, but everybody has that right in this country, thank God. 